All right. So we are going to start with the ABCs of salvation because as we are looking for the soon return of Jesus, we want to make sure, one, that we do know him because there are other Jesuses. There are cults. There are um, there are doctrines of demons out there that sound a lot like Christianity, but they twist the identity of Jesus. And so first and foremost, we want to make sure that as we are looking for him, when he does come, we get to meet him because we know him. And so how do you know Jesus? How are you? Can you be sure that when the rapture happens or when you die, you are face to face with Jesus and you go to heaven? Number one, you understand that it's not about you. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why God put on humanity. Jesus came. The son of God came and put on humanity and died for us. It's very important to understand that Jesus is not only the son of God, he is God. He is God. And so that way he is able to pay the price for our sin. And so he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of Jesus through Christ Jesus. So we have to understand we need him. We put our trust in him and then we are calling upon his name. And what that means is that we call out to him, cry out to him because we can't do this on our own. And when we do that, he saves us. And so we need to understand this for ourselves, but we also need to understand it so we can communicate the gospel with other people, understanding that the gospel is the good news that we can't save ourselves. That's good news, but we can't save ourselves, but God provided a way through Jesus that we can be saved. And so, so we know, and so we can communicate that salvation with other people. And so this week, we're going to look at how the end comes like a flood. And we're going to look at um, what Daniel said, what Jesus said. And what the enemies of God are saying right now and how it reflects that. And so here, I thought this was a, a really cool picture about of what is happening right now. Because evil, here the floodgates are being held up by the Holy Spirit in the church. And so here we are the restrainer. The Holy Spirit in us is the restrainer that's restraining the evil that is about to, you know, there, there's a flood coming now. We, we see it right now, but the flood that will come is after, after we're gone. When the restrainer is removed, this evil is going to pour out. And that really, the way that God's wrath starts to pour out on humanity will be with the restrainer being removed. Man is going to be left to his own devices. There'll be no restraining power of the church here to keep the evil from coming out like a flood on the world. And so you look right now at what's happening um, with Israel. There's still a restrainer on all the armies coming in. Part of that restrainer is because of America, what America is doing right now. America is actually restraining some of the armies that are that want to come against Israel they're thinking twice because America is there how much longer America is going to be there I don't know the rapture could take it out or it could be something else we know biblically America is not an end time player at least not a good guy in the as an end time player and so here we see also all the evil that you see just pouring out in the world right now there's still a restraining force here and after we're gone, it will be like Micah 7, describing a world where the righteous are completely off the earth. There are no righteous to be found. And that will be what will happen shortly after the rapture. It, the flood will come. But the end comes like a flood. And we see this Isaiah 9, um, 26b. Um, 
And I'm sorry, that's not Isaiah. That is Daniel. <laughs> I don't know why I put Isaiah there. I was looking at too many Bible verses at once, but that's Daniel 9, 26 B. The end will come like a flood. And until the end, there will be war. Desolations have been decreed. And so here, that is Daniel 9, 26. When Daniel is being told about the 70 weeks of Daniel, and when the end comes, the prophecy here is that it will come like a flood. And until the end, there will be war. And so we're seeing this war now, and the war is not going to go anywhere. War is going to continue. There's going to be a false peace that will come over, um, and Israel will make a decree with, will make a covenant with death, will we'll make a covenant to try to avoid the overwhelming scourge that she's in right now. She's going to try to avoid it by making a covenant with these nations that are coming together right now, trying to come up with this covenant. Um, but war will continue until the end. So what does the Bible say about this flood in the last days? So there's a comparison between the end and a flood. It's repeated in scripture and today a flood. We see that. We see the end being compared to a flood in scripture. And then we see the enemy today repeatedly calling what they are doing a flood. So this is interesting. Um, are they, is the enemy, do they know that they're quoting Daniel? Do they know that they're quoting Jesus? Do they know that they're that they're quoting Isaiah? Do they know that they're quoting God when they say this? And and I don't think that they do, but the demonic influences that are behind them and that are behind their words, I believe are very aware of the Bible. You know, the demons, they know the Bible much better than most Christians do, unfortunately. And and so these these things are being triggered. Uh the enemy it does appear that the enemy has to let us know what they're doing, at least to some degree. I don't fully understand why they think that they do need to do that or why they tell us what they're doing, but they do do that. And so here we saw um, Nasrallah, his speech, he, he had a speech this past Saturday on November 11th, and this is Martyr's Day for them. And so on this speech, he kept calling this war a flood. The name of this war that started on October 7th to the enemy is called the Alaska flood. And so that's going to come in. We're going to really look at that and see why they're calling this flood, this, this war that's about Gaza and them coming in and mutilating and murdering innocent civilians why they're calling it the Alaska flood that's going to be very interesting so but to build this case in what Daniel was talking about and in the context here we're going to start with the 70 weeks of Daniel because this is really essential to understand where we are in time to understand where we are in time we need to understand that God gave Daniel 70 weeks. And we talk about this all the time because that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting on the last week. We're waiting on the last seven years of the 70 years that were determined to Daniel. And so Daniel originally, originally he was, he was um, repenting for his people and he was actually asking God about a different 70 originally. Um, Daniel, through reading the book of Jeremiah, had realized that Israel's Babylonian captivity was coming to an end because in Jeremiah, he saw that Israel was only supposed to be in captivity for 70 years. And so he was repenting for his nation and he was asking God about this 70 years and when they would be able to go home. That's kind of, it kind of sounds like us today. It's like, God, when do we get to go home? <laughs> what about the 70? It appears it's almost there up. When do we get to go home? And that's what he was asking. And so Gabriel came to him 
And he told him, yes, the 70 is here, but he brought a different 70 that he want, that God wanted to reveal to Daniel a different 70 and not 70 years, but 70 weeks of years. And so Daniel nine, starting in 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And so we see this actually coming to be in the book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra, where um, that happened, where there was the decree to return and rebuild. And so said until from that time, until the Messiah is the 69 week period. So after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. And so there's a, there's one week first, there's, there's the one week and then there's the 62 weeks. So it's 69 weeks. So after that, the Messiah will be cut off and you can see it right here. And that's where Messiah came and he will be cut off at the cross remember, but not for himself. You know, Jesus didn't die for himself. He died for creation. He died for us. He, he died to redeem mankind to himself. And the people of the prince to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So in this prophecy, commas, periods, um, they cover years, many, many years. And so we see here, Jesus is cut off but and the people of the prince to come, this doesn't happen until 40 years after he's cut off, where Rome ransacks the city and the sanctuary. That is 40 years after Jesus is cut off. And so we see here that Jesus came 483 years, 69 weeks. He came right on time and he was cut off. He was crucified right on time. To redeem Israel and all of creation. Now, when he was cut off, the clock paused for these 70 weeks of Daniel. And we've been living in this pause called the church age. We've been living in these 2,000 years of Israel being set aside until the time of the end. When God will turn his attention back to her. So time has been paused at the 69th week. Now, 40 years later, 40 years after the crucifixion, uh, the people of the prince to, can't, to come, the Antichrist, they came and they destroyed Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. So what does that tell us about the, about the Antichrist? It tells us that he comes from this revived Roman Empire. And Rome didn't go anywhere. You know, Rome, Rome just morphed into this world government that we have going on right now, the United Nations. Um, Rome didn't go anywhere. The revived Roman Empire through the Roman Catholic Church and through world governments just went undercover. But the world leaders and the world family leaders that have been running everything, they, they've been there all along. And now they're coming back and they're not even trying to pretend that they're doing a new world order anymore. I mean, the days of calling that a conspiracy theory are way over because they, every time they get together, they talk about the new world order. They're fighting over who gets to have the new world order. And so we see here the people is this united government, um, a united revived Roman empire. And and understand too, and what we what we see right now with Israel and Palestine, when Rome did that, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple um, in 70 AD, and and after that, with with the revolts and completely taking over Jerusalem, they renamed it. So they renamed Israel after the Philistines because that's what they did. They renamed the lands after the ancient enemy. And so that's where Palestine came from is just over years in the translation, but they renamed them really Philistine. 
So, but that wasn't the end. It's been paused, but it's going to pick back up again. And so here finishing in, in um, Daniel 9, 26 B here, this is what we started off with. And the end of it shall be with a flood. So here we have the Antichrist, the people of the Antichrist, the Roman Empire. They destroyed Israel. They renamed Israel. They scattered Israel. And the enemy's like, not done. You know, God pressed pause. And suddenly it's been the age of grace. And God's attention has been turned to his church for the past 2000 years. But it continues that the end will be with a flood. It's going to come quickly. And that's what Jesus said. He said, behold, I come quickly. And the word quickly there was like a tactometer. The word quickly is tacos, which means when he comes, it revs up. It's coming quickly. You know, I'm no prophet, but I know God's word. And by God's word, things are not going to get better. Things are going to continue to get more intense they're going to continue to get crazier. The wars and rumors of wars are going to get more intense. The earthquakes and volcanoes are going to get more intense. Natural disasters are going to get more intense. The world government craziness is going to get more intense. All of it is going to, these birth pains are going to get stronger and closer together until the baby's born, until we're born. But the good news is we have a birthday coming. And so the end of it will be like a flood until the end of war desolations are determined and so the end is associated with a flood and the end is associated with war and desolations so something marks this time that the clock starts starts back it's marked like a flood and so we see here continuing in 27 because the actual start of the clock for the last seven years is the covenant. Then he, this is the antichrist, the he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And so what this is saying is that, and you see this right now, the enemy is foaming at the mouth to come up with a covenant. Two-state solution, two-state solution, Abraham Accords, Abraham Accords. We have to have a ceasefire. We have to come up with some way to solve this. Jerusalem is this burning some stone that everybody is, right now the world is literally drunk over what to do about Jerusalem, what to do about Israel. And what you hear is, is Israel, Israel. But as we're going to look at, it's really about Jerusalem. It's really about Jerusalem. That's really what this is all about. And the world is drunk about it. If you look at some of the atrocities that are going on in the world, that if anybody was going to do an outcry about it, it would be the things going on in Afghanistan, the things going on. There's whole people groups that nobody cares about. Because it's not Israel. Why? Because this is a spiritual battle. It's not about the land or the sea. It's not about the country, but it's about the dwelling of his majesty. You know, that that's a quote from Mariasu, but, <laughs> but it's so true. And so here, the official start clock for the last week or the last seven years of Daniel's 70th week. And understand the last seven years of Daniel's 70th week, that is the last seven years of man's rule on earth. That's the tribulation. After the tribulation, Jesus comes and he sets up his kingdom. This is how close we are. We're looking for the starting line of the last seven years of human history before Jesus is king and ruling from Jerusalem. This is how close we are. And so the confirmation of this covenant by the Antichrist is the starting point for the last seven years. The third temple is built during this time. It could start to be built beforehand. I don't think so, though. I think the third temple is actually going to be part of the deal itself. 
and the sacrifices are going to start back. They are stopped at the midpoint by the Antichrist himself when he stops them and he claims to be God. And he takes, he goes into the Holy of Holies and he takes the seat as God. And so we see all this stuff coming and it is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the center of everything. And it all started, and we're going to really unpack this. It all started with the red heifers. That's what the enemy is actually telling us now. That they started planning this about two years ago when they first got a hint that there are unblemished red heifers and Israel is wanting to sacrifice them as soon as they're of age. And so they have been doing this and they have been looking for the opportunity because they're afraid of Israel sacrificing again. And it reminded me of Nehemiah when Nehemiah was re rebuilding the wall, the, um, you know, the bad guys, they came up and, and they're like, what are you going to do? You're going to rebuild it in a day. Are you going to sacrifice again? They're so afraid of God's people returning to their God. They're so afraid of that. And they should be because the enemy knows that's, that's the end. Jesus returns when the Jews say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's when he comes back. And the enemy is shaking in his boots that they're going to say that one day. So Jesus expanded on Daniel in his Olivet Discourse. And so we're going to start a little bit before that um, here in Matthew 24. We're going to talk about how he talked about Daniel and then what he said about the flood. So Matthew 24, therefore, when you see, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples because they had specifically asked him, you know, what is the sign? What's Because he said this temple right here, that none of this was going to be left standing. And they asked him, why? When is this going to happen? What is the sign of you coming and taking your kingdom? And so they didn't understand that they were asking him two questions. They didn't understand that the temple being destroyed and him coming as king would be separated by nearly 2,000 years. They, they didn't know that. So they were asking him two questions. And Jesus told them, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. So this tells us, yes, the temple will be rebuilt. And the Antichrist will go into the holy of holies to declare himself God. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So he's telling Israel what to do. This is all Israel had to be back in her land for this to happen. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be and unless those days were shortened no flesh would be saved but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened now understand jesus is not speaking to the church he is speaking to israel he's speaking to jews he is speaking to those people that will be here during the tribulation he's speaking to israel that will be in Jerusalem during the tribulation. Jesus goes on to warn about the great tribulation, the last three and a half years and what will happen to the Jewish people during that time. And he tells them about the his coming at the end of the tribulation. Now notice Jesus is specifically speaking to Jews in Israel, Jerusalem, regarding the final act of the end. The final act of the Bible happens in Israel, in Jerusalem. That's where everything is focused on. If anything is still alive in America, 
we don't know about it because the the purpose the highlight the center of the world according to god is israel and jerusalem and this is this is something that that a lot of Christians miss and some are just completely wrong because they try to spiritualize and say that Israel is, is us. And that's not it at all. We are the bride. You don't want to be Israel. You want to be the bride. You do not want to be Israel. Trust me. You want to be who you are. And so, so here it's, it's all centered in Israel. And that's why you see all this kicking up right now. No, no wonder Israel is again becoming the center of the attention of the world because Satan knows she's the center of the attention of the world. He knows that she's that to God. Israel is, is the apple of God's eye and she is the center of what God is going to do in the last days. And God is turning his attention back to her. And we're seeing this right now, right before our eyes. So after this, Jesus goes back to the beginning of the end. And so when you read the Olivet Discourse, you have to understand that Jesus is not going in um, exact chronological order. He was telling them what's going to happen at the end to them. But then he goes back to the beginning and he answers their question on what is the sign. And he starts with the fig tree generation. He goes back and he says, when you see the fig tree generation, when you see Israel become a nation again, of course, they didn't understand the fig tree sprouting leaves again, because they didn't know at that time that Israel was going to be dispersed and that Jerusalem was going to be defeated in just 40 years. They didn't know all that was going to happen. But he said, when you see this happen, then all this will be fulfilled before this generation passes away. And then he goes on to say, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the son of man. And so what happened in Noah's days? The flood. Now, God is not going to destroy the earth with a flood again. We see increased floods every day. It seems some part of the world has an unprecedented flood happening. But that's not the way that the entire world will be destroyed again. Next time it'll be by fire. But he was making a point that things are similar to what they were before. Before the last destruction, the world is in the same basic place today. So for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And did not know until the flood came and took them away. So also will the coming of the son of man be. For two men will be in the field. One will be taken and another left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and another left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so this is very important for us to understand. One, this right here proves that this is a pre-tribulation rapture, because this will happen before the flood, before the floodgates come down. Um, once the tribulation has begun, the flood is upon the people. And this is going to happen at a time that can't be calculated. Once the tribulation begins, it is calculatable. <laughs> you know, God gives exact numbers of years, months, day counts. There is an exact day count. So in order for this to come upon people while they're still eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage and being completely oblivious that the Lord's day is upon them, this is a pre-tribulation rapture. And the rapture itself 
is God's wrath. Not only the horror of millions of people suddenly disappearing all over the globe and the graves opening up. You know, you think about the destruction that that will happen. That will be earthquakes all over the globe. I think little EMPs all over the globe because I think will be energy. Um, but it will be complete destruction. There'll be planes falling out the sky. There'll be cars that are suddenly without drivers. There'll be people freaking out all over the world. But not only that, just like Micah 7 talks about, suddenly the righteous will be gone. And there is no one that you can turn to that has your back, not even your family. Because people don't even understand the restraining force that is in the church right now. And the way that the Holy Spirit through us restrains evil. People don't even understand that until it's too late, until it's gone. And so we see here that it's like the days before the flood. Um, the pre-tribulation rapture. Also, we see here that... This is a rescue mission. We don't know fully what it is that we're being rescued from. But if you look at Revelation 12 and you see how the woman Israel is in travail. And right now the woman Israel is literally in travail. Israel is in the midst of serious birth pains. She is travailing right now. And when she gives birth to her child, the enemy is lurching there to try to destroy the child before it before he can be raptured up and so our rapture is in haste for a reason and we probably won't know exactly why that is until we're on the way up or afterwards and we figure out what it was that God saved us from but the rapture will happen suddenly pulling us out of the floodgates that will be unleashed and it'll happen at a time that we don't expect, but at the same time, we're told to watch and we're told that we will see the day approaching. And so um, we are the pre-flood generation. <laughs> you know, we are right here before the tribulation starts. We are the last generation that gets to see the world before the tribulation period begins. And so we're in the days before the flood right now. Noah and his family knew the flood was coming, but the masses were clueless until it was too late. You know, Noah knew for about 120 years that the flood was going to come. And he was warning people, he was building this boat, and the only people that were saved was just his eight, just his eight. And so that, that shows us that there's a pattern of it being a remnant that actually is looking for God and not a great multitude. We saw that with the flood. It was only a remnant that were looking for God. We see that when Jesus first came, even though there was a direct count to when he would come 483 years they knew he would be coming. They were looking for him to be coming around that time. The, the rabbis knew, but he wasn't what they wanted. So they just closed their eyes to it. When Jesus came, he was frustrated that there was only a handful of people that were looking for him and that received him. When he came, the vast majority, the religious leaders were purposefully ignorant and so we see from jesus's first coming most people did were not ready most people were not looking for him he was not what they wanted he was not what they expected they wanted someone to come and free them from rome that's still what most christians want is someone to come and free them from the global government <laughs> and and he will <laughs> this time he will but you need to have, you need to take the suffering servant. You need to take the lamb. You got to die to yourself. And so we see the pattern all throughout scripture. It's always the remnant. There will be an amazing revival 
But we know from scripture that happens after we're gone. That happens during the tribulation. There's a number of people that come in that can't even be counted. But Jesus said, when he comes, will he even find faith? And that's because there's very little people that are actually looking for him, that actually believe that this is true. So we're in the days before the flood right now. And Noah and his family knew the flood was coming, but the masses were clueless and they were swept away. Today is similar. Um, there's a remnant that knows that the flood is coming and the tribulation is about to start. But the masses are going to be caught off guard and they're going to be swept away by the tribulation. And this is heartbreaking because we see the, you know, we see the, um, the insanity right now. Right now we see this craziness of in, you know, 1400 people murdered um, ruthlessly. I mean, you know, there's, there's videos there's there there's there's no way that you can deny it as ridiculous as denying the holocaust was right now there's no but people are denying it people are denying it because they don't want to see truth but you see the evil and how people will so quickly turn on the victim and will so quickly believe a lie vehemently believe a lie and get completely behind an absolute lie. And after we're gone, that's going to still be the case. There will be the greatest revival ever. But that's still going to be the minority. The masses of people during the tribulation are going to be cursing God. Even when they know he's true. They're going to be cursing him. And they're going to be hating him. And they'll be persecuting those that receive Jesus. And they'll be persecuting the Jews because of God. And they'll be overtly doing it to where now they do it, you know, like they try to lie about why they're doing it. But they'll be outright overtly doing it because they hate God during the tribulation. And so the flood, the enemy here. They boast about the flood. And so we see here that the flood is boasted of by the enemies of God. And um, we see here, you know, this is um, uh, Nasrallah when he was doing his speeches here. He said the Alaska flood was hidden from all faction to maintain secrecy. Even when even we didn't know. And he's saying how they did such a good job of keeping it, of keeping it under wraps. And it is incredible what they did because as they've gone into Gaza and they could see, they, they actually put up mock villages. They put up mock villages and they played out and practiced this. The, the people had to know what was happening. The people... Um, in Gaza, the Palestinians had to know what they were planning because they took and they they did mock Israeli homes and they practiced this over and over and over again to get it right. They they practiced the the paragliding down. They practiced all of that. And so here, um, Operation Alaska Flood was decided 100 percent by Palestinians. The execution was 100% Palestinian, and the Palestinians hid it from everyone. And so that was Nasrallah from his infamous speech. And so we see here that they are um, trying to get together the entire Arab world. And they actually met, the Arab League met this past week, and on the 11th also, um, about Gaza. And trying to get more countries involved in going against Israel. And like I said, I, I think one thing that's holding it back, one thing that's restraining it is America, um, is the uh, the presence of the power there. And of course, um, there's lots of, there's, uh, you know, there's lots of pressure now uh, to try to not be 
um, on Israel's side. And eventually, you know, America, we, we won't be on Israel's side eventually because we know God is the only one that's going to come forward and is going to protect Israel. When Ezekiel 38 and 39 happens, America's not there. Nobody's there to help her. God Almighty destroys her enemies and she sees that he's all she really needs. And so um, it's not a bad thing for her that no one else is there because that puts her where she needs to be to find God. But the reason that we're not there is, is scary because you turn your back on Israel. You try to divide Israel's land. You strong arm her the way even that we're already strong arming her. Um, our days are numbered. America's days are numbered. But that's okay because our home is the kingdom. Our home is not this country. Our home is the kingdom. And um, that is perfectly fine. So, so we see here Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the West and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And so God is going to take care of the flood. So you don't, you know, Israel is going to be fine. We know the safest place in the world is going to be Israel. Every other place is going to be brought low, but Israel will be fine. So war, um, the war, the reason it started here, and we see this war, Lebanon is coming in more now. And so, of course, um, you know, Nasrallah, he had this big speech and every speech seems to like fall flat. But basically, we know that they will come in. And when they come in, I, I do believe Israel is going to um, is going to is going to defeat them. So we see here over and over again using flood. The Alaska flood was hidden. I mean, we just we just read that how it was hidden from all factions um, alert here, Lebanon-Israel border, the northern flood has not begun yet, but it's inevitably coming. And so here we see the northern flood. They keep using that word flood. Um, and it, you know, we know the enemy uh, is not going to be able to stand up against God. So one in three in Lebanon favor war with Israel. Now, Israel has already put out flyers in southern Lebanon. Um, that's what that's the difference between Israel and terrorists. Israel puts out flyers and says, we're, we're going after these evil people amongst you. Move up north. Go get out of the way. Um, the enemy, they want to try to kill as many innocent people as possible. And so we see here Hezbollah is um, bombarding Israel's north and they have done They've been um, recently going after towers, going after the in infrastructure. And one thing I was thinking about is um, Ezekiel, this is not Ezekiel 38 yet, but, but we see it setting up. But in Ezekiel 38, when it says unwalled, um, that, that could mean royal area, royal area. And so it means unsecured. And that actually is what they're doing in the northern mountains right now is they're trying to unsecure the area so Israel can't respond quite as quickly. Um, they've taken too long to do it, though, so they can't take Israel um, off guard now. So, but what is the reason here? The reason that they're doing this, they have now revealed, is because they want to stop Israel from returning to her God. They want to stop Israel from sacrificing a red heifer. They want to stop Israel from rebuilding her temple and returning to her God. And so, you know, God and and here the the enemies, these are God's enemies. You know, the enemies of Israel, this this war is is really between Satan and God. That's really what this is about. So God refers to the enemies that are coming against Israel as his enemies. They are mostly unaware that they're pawns in this war. They, they really don't know that their God 
Allah is actually Satan. They don't know that. They don't understand that. They've been trained since infancy. Um, they've been indoctrinated in evil. And so they don't, they don't know. And we need to pray for them that God will rescue them and wake them up and show them truth. Uh, because we don't want anyone dying and waking up in hell. They've been indoctrinated, you know, and so I pray that God will, will break through and will show them. And, and it's beautiful hearing the stories of, of people that used to be in ISIS, people that used to be in Hamas, people that used to be in, you know, these horrible terrorist organizations and they found Jesus. Those are beautiful, beautiful stories. And so what is the enemy saying? What, what, what is he admitting? They're calling this war that began on October 7th. The Alaska flood. So again, flood. They're calling it the Alaska flood. And why? Because they reportedly started planning it after the news of the red heifers. And so it was all about trying to stop this from happening. And the fear um, that Israel would end up uh, tearing down their mosque, that Israel would end up doing that to build their third temple. What's interesting is the things that they're doing are actually putting Alaska in danger, not because of Israel, but because of them, because their missiles have been close to blowing up their own dome and their own mosque. And that may just be the way that God does it, or God may just open up the earth with a, with an earthquake and take it down. But it's interesting that it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. Their greatest fear, they're actually, actually setting up to come true. And what they're doing right now is actually going to pave the way for the third temple to be rebuilt. Their reaction to try to stop it from happening is actually propelling it forward. And um, it is fascinating the way that this is happening. But this war is actually bringing the third temple into more of a reality quicker than it, if it wasn't. It's actually tearing down boundaries rather than, rather than adding them. And so here we see that this is leading to the building of the third temple. And we see it right there in Daniel and in Matthew 24 that the third temple will be built. And what they're so afraid of is gonna happen. The sacrifices will be resumed. They will sacrifice to their God. And, and the Antichrist is going to stop it. The Antichrist is going to stop it. And he's going to go in and he's going to say that he's God. And so we see all this stress and all this hoopla over sacrificing a red heifer. But that's what it all came down to. And so we see here the unblemished red heifers are the key to understanding the conflict in the Middle East. And here, um, Nasrallah said the, uh, the Iran-backed militias will prevent attacks on Alaska. Now, the Jews were never attacking. They, they would say that they were storming the Alaska when they would go up on the Temple Mount to pray. But understand the enemy, Jews praying to God is horrifying to Satan because he knows Jesus returns when they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Jewish people returning to their God is horrifying to Satan. And what this war is doing is it really is putting in the forefront of people how biblical this is. And people are asking questions and Jews are receiving Jesus and asking questions and getting closer but cut out of this. And so it's, it's God uses what the enemy means for evil. He uses for good and to bring people to him. So we see here, almost everything is ready for the third temple. The red heifers have been brought in last year. Um, they want to sacrifice them by April, 2024, but they're um, for Passover. But there is a lot of news coming out that that may actually be not true. That that may be put out there to make the Arabs think that they've got a longer cushion of time. Because 
there is rumors that some of those heifers are ready right now. And if that's the case, they're not going to want to take the chance that something might happen to where they wouldn't be kosher anymore, to where they wouldn't be um, perfect anymore. They would want to immediately sacrifice them as soon as they could. And so they may be lying about how old they really are. So they can do it before anybody knows to try to stop it. So here we are yearning for the temple and suddenly there's a red heifer here. And we understand what that means. Something is about to happen. And yes, something is definitely about to happen. <laughs> and so we see here um, the final thought. I was thinking about the difference between a flood and a river. You know, we have this flood and this flood is destruction. This this flood that comes in at the tribulation is a destruction of everything that man made. There's everything that man made is going to be destroyed. And it's going to be replaced in a very short time by the perfect, by Jesus and his kingdom. Uh, but everything that man made is going to is going to be torn down literally um, by this flood. And there's an illustration that I heard um, years ago that's always really stuck with me on a being a river and not a flood. And because rivers are shallow, they're destructive, they're muddy, they cover a lot of space, but they don't go deep. And us as Christians, we can sometimes do that. We can be just like an inch thick, you know, an inch deep. And so shallow and muddy and compromising that we're destructive for the kingdom rather than good for the kingdom. But rivers, they're focused. They're not super wide. They're focused, but they're deep and they sustain life and they're profitable. They're good. And so I want to be a river. I want to be someone that's deep. I want to be someone that, you know, I don't have to know everything, but I want to know what I know. And I don't want to be muddy. I don't want to compromise. I want to stand on what truth is. And, you know, if I get made fun of for it, that's okay. If I, you know, if people don't like me because I'm not worldly, that's okay. You know, I want to be a river. And how beautiful um, that the world is healed after the tribulation by a river. We see the end, the destruction is referred to as a flood. But the healing is referred to as a river. There's this river of life. And we read about it in Ezekiel 47. After the tribulation, the entire world is healed from the river of life that comes from Jerusalem. It's always Jerusalem. The river of life springs forth from the temple in Jerusalem. And that river of life will go out and it will heal the entire planet. And it's in Ezekiel 47. It's Revelation 22, Zechariah 14, 8. God tells us the way that he restores creation.